you for joining our digital rights learning exchange down, town hall session. And my name is Ufa Made. I'm the co-founder and global lead of Digital Grassroots. I am going to be moderating this session today. And in time, I would let all of our amazing speakers here introduce themselves. The essence of this session is to highlight the challenges and co encountered by digital rights advocates in safeguarding human rights and democratic values of freely exercising their citizenship in the digital space and beyond it. Um, we are basically going to outline a program that we held in this year. We had two cohorts of this program and the essence of this program was to enable activists from underrepresented communities to critically think about the digital rights issues that they faced in their communities and how they are going to go about carrying out advocacy around those issues. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining. Um, to start with, I'm going to pass on to Sarah from NDI to talk a bit about the DRL, DRLX program and NDI's participation in the program. Thank you very much. Great, thanks Ufa. So um, my name is Sarah Moulton. I'm the Deputy Director for Democracy and Technology at the National Democratic Institute based in Washington, DC. Um, we have offices in about 50 different countries around the world and we are focusing on strengthening the uh, democratic and political process uh, with governments, civil society, uh, political actors around the world. And for the last several years, um, our team has been involved with an initiative called the Open Internet for Democracy Initiative, in which we are working with uh, digital rights activists around the world to strengthen their ability to push back against anti-democratic actions um, that threaten the online space and threaten human rights. And for the last several years, we've been running something called the Open Internet Leaders Program, uh, together with my colleagues from the Center for International Private Enterprise and the Center for International Media Assistance. And this has been our kind of flagship effort to support emerging digital rights activists to help them um, do advocacy projects in their uh, local context and to help strengthen their advocacy skills through a year-long um, fellowship program. The challenge with this particular initiative is that we get so many excellent um, applicants from all backgrounds and want to do something to support them all, but can't. We only select six each year, so it's a very small group, and wanted to find another way to engage so many of these applicants, and there was clearly an appetite for uh, learning, you know, being part of this digital rights movement and uh, being able to work on these issues, but we couldn't do it. And so um, we've been looking for an opportunity uh, to find, uh, to support these, these emerging activists who maybe not quite had the opportunity to really uh, be part of the more well-known or established leadership fellowship programs. So uh, we, luckily, uh, through some funding from the Mott Foundation, were able to partner with Digital Grassroots put together and support and kind of an existing course structure that they already had um, and in make a curriculum that revolved, a, you know, in large part around a uh, open internet for democracy advocacy playbook uh, that we have. You can find it at openinternet.global. Um, but that playbook is really designed to give kind of basic foundation for steps that you as a digital rights activist can keep in mind as you're beginning your digital rights advocacy journey. So that may include um, basic lessons like, uh, like uh, stakeholder mapping, how to develop a communication strategy, keeping yourself safe online, how do you evaluate the success of your campaign. But it's really a lot of kind of foundational lessons uh, that are hard to get if you're new to the space and you don't know where to start. What are the best ways to do that? So 
together with Digital Grassroots, uh, we are able to support these two different cohorts, which I can let them speak more about in detail. Um, but our motivation for that, like again, for the whole program, was really that there are so many um, dynamic individuals who really want to get started in the space, but don't have the foundational skills to really uh, take part in the more established programs out there. And so how do we get them? How do we get them to that place? And so. That was our uh, motivation for uh, supporting Digital Grassroots to work together on this initiative. And hopefully there'll be more opportunities in the future. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that excellent overview. Um, I'm also going to pass the microphone now to Fatu. Um, Fatu will introduce herself more, but um, a bit of an overview. Fatu was one of the participants of the DR Alex program in cohort two. So she's going to share her insights, highlights of the program, and what participation in that program meant for her. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Ufa and the Digital Grass Gurus and also the Democracy Internet Leader uh, for organizing uh, the Internet Learning, uh, Digital Right Learning Exchange Program where a lot of uh, Internet activists and fellow also applied and I was uh, part of the 20% uh, selected for, for the program. So the program was very interesting and we have learned a lot on digital rights, how to start a project, what you should do, and how also to, uh, to make it like something very interactive when uh, everyone will give their insights, not just to come and write your projects and just start, like if you want to solve problem, you have to, to solve it by their roots, not only to do it at your own, but you have to interact with the people that are facing the problem. And that's what uh, they teach us during the whole program. And also, after starting your project, how to monitor it, how to do the evaluation. Like, it's not like just starting your project and after there is no follow up, but they teach us a lot of skills and also how to do it, it's not like something, um, like a lot of program, I participated on a lot of program, but this one was very interesting. And also the timeline was uh, around uh, six, six weeks. It was not too long, and during the six weeks we learned a lot, so I just have to tell you thank you very much for organizing uh, this program, and I hope that in the next few years, Instead of selecting only 20 people, you will increase it so more African people and also other people from the other continent also can participate uh, on this program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fatu. And yes, we do understand that there will be a lack of capacity sometimes to do more, but um, now at least we have the blueprint, so we're currently discussing how we can make the program more open and more inclusive to accommodate more people. Thank you very much once again, Fatu. I'm going to pass on to Esther now um, to talk about how the program outcome, what the program outcomes were, and the impact, the results, the resources that were used in delivering this program to our community. Um, Esther was part of our core team in delivering this program, so of course she'll be talking from a very informed perspective. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Ufa, and um, thank you everyone for coming and those joining online and in person. We're very excited to have you here, and we know it's the last day of the IGF, so it's like if you come to a session, you're really, really amazing, so thank you. Um, I'll just say that this year we hosted the Digital Rights Learning Exchange, and the amazing thing is that we did it remotely. We were able to reach 40 digital rights advocates who are able to participate in our program. So we, we first opened the call for application and as Sarah shared, we wanted it to be reflective 
of their communities, even when they're getting information from the playbook, we wanted them to be able to adapt it to their own work. So when we opened the call for application, we recruited the first cohort, and through that four weeks of training, they were able to learn digital rights advocacy tools that they could use for their own uh, communities and the work that they're doing. The unique aspect of this learning part was that they had to practically learn how to engage in digital rights. And they had to do it by collaborating with other young people and other advocates in their program. So that meant that they had to learn to engage with people they did not know, people they may not necessarily agree with, and we had some standout projects that came out of that, and which was presented at a finale event. Um, so we were able to have specific topics um, like internet shutdowns, hate speech, privacy and surveillance, and um, also accessibility. Those were the topics we were working with. And uh, after the four weeks of learning and the final two weeks was focused on practical ways of monitoring and evaluation and also staying safe online and how they can take care of themselves psychologically and also in terms of digital security. So this was a very holistic program uh, in the way that even as they were learning to take care of themselves, they were matched with industry experts who they could talk with um, in their own sessions, small group sessions, and learn about how they could apply what they have learned in the program. Uh, so after the first cohort, we realized that there was still an appetite and there is a big gap that we had to fill. So we had to do another second cohort um, with some of the participants who had applied earlier. And we found that the response was really positive in both cohorts. And the most uh, appealing part was working with other uh, advocates from different regions and learning from each other like a cross-pollination of ideas and collaborating to build a hypothetical digital rights campaign at the end of it. So it was very practical, very hands-on, but also uh, a good way to build community and network with other people in in the region who are working on the same issues. Uh, because what we found was there, there were personal stories with the digital rights advocates, uh, whether it be harassment online, or if they're lost uh, one of their family members who are digital rights advocates. So it was a really um, heartfelt uh, engagement and building of solidarity between digital rights advocates who otherwise would not have that, had that opportunity to engage. So that was um, what was the core essence of our program. And, and I'll just summarize it. Uh, the core components of the program was a remote learning, and then there was community engagement uh, between uh, the cohort participants, and then there was the mentorship, and then presenting their final digital rights campaigns, which were hypothetical, and that we hope that in the future, we'll be able to collaborate with others to fund that uh, those projects that come out of programs like this because they are really uh, tackling core issues and doing it from a local context and um, trying to build these digital rights advocates to bridge what is happening at the grassroots level and also at the high level so that there is that knowledge exchange so that we can create a more open and democratic internet for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther. Um, that was amazing. Um, at this point, I'm going to open up the mic for questions, comments, suggestions about the program. We understand that we are probably talking about this from an organizer's perspective, but we really want to hear comments, 
opinions, questions about the program, its impact, um, we would appreciate that. Thank you very much. Oh, we have two hands raised. Sorry, we'll take one first. And um, we're also watching the online chat, so if there's anything, let us know. Hi there, my name is Morgan Frost from the Center for International Private Enterprise. Thank you so much for organizing this session and it was really great to hear more about the program. Um, Esther, I just wanted to follow up on something that you mentioned around lessons learned and sharing different experiences. You mentioned harassment online, but I was also wondering if you could maybe expand upon what were some of the commonalities across the different participants, thanks. Uh, thank you so much for that question. Uh, yeah, it was really good to have, in our second cohort, we had seven countries, and in the first cohort, we had over 10 countries So, the, uh, from the Africa region. So it was really interesting to see what the commonalities are. And part of that was the groups that came out of it. Um, there were groups on topics such as hate speech, internet shutdowns, and uh, privacy and surveillance, and accessibility. And those are core issues that are affecting those regions. And something that was very critical was how they were able to collaborate and create one project as a group, even if they were from different contexts. Um, a standout was um, a group where we had an Ethiopian, a South African, a Cameroonian, and a Kenyan, and they created um, a hypothetical digital rights advocacy project on the shutdowns in Tigray here. So it's really thinking about how, as a continent, we do have our own problems, but that there is a place to create a common digital rights advocacy to respond to that. And I thought it was just very amazing. And I recommend uh, everyone to read the report uh, we have on that specifically. Thank you. And um, thank you very much for that, Esther. If I could just add a bit more, another commonality that we noticed was in the participants deciding what issues they wanted to work on. So the structure of the program was that as organizers, we provided thematic themes that we could support and encourage the participants to, after introducing what these themes were to them, encourage them to select the one that they would love to work on. And it was always interesting to see what issues the participants wanted to work on. And in each cohort, which which um, theme would be the most popular. Access and affordability was always the group with the most participants. In the first cohort, we noticed that hate speech was popular and internet shutdown was not. Fast forward to four months after, hate speech was no longer popular, but um, internet shutdown was now popular. So that was something very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, I know we have another question in the back. Um, can we please take that? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm Anton from SafeNet, stand for Southeast Asia Freedom of Expression Network. We are a digital rights organization uh, based in Indonesia. Uh, we started in 2013 as uh, working for freedom of expression merely, but then since 2018 we expanding our program to be more in digital rights, including freedom of expression, uh, access to the internet, and also digital rights. Uh, sorry, digital security. Uh, so that's a intro short introduction. I have uh, four questions. <laughs> Thanks, I'm really happy that I'm here and I can uh, listen to your uh, great uh, story about uh, your program. Uh, I, I have three actually. First, I want to know more about uh, how you keep the sustainability of the program, including with the participant after the program. It's not from the uh, organizer, but also maybe from NDI. Uh, and then, so, is there any uh, success story that you feel proud about from the uh, program and the last one is: uh, Is there any possibility to expand this program to Southeast Asia region so we can collaborate uh, more in the future? Thank you. Thanks, Anton. Um, 
big fan of your organization as well. So I know we've worked with you in the past as NDI. So, um, you know, the sustainability is a great question because we know that, you know, as us as NDI, we only have enough funding for certain cohorts or we can only go so far. So we tried to kind of build in the relationship development aspect within the program so that the participants were interacting with each other and developing relationships with each other through these group project efforts. And because we really believe strongly in the power of networks and um, especially cross cohorts, cross um, sector and geographies, that, that is, those relationships are going to kind of help sustain that work. If you know that you can reach out to somebody for a particular problem or if you're, you know, they've already been through this with you. So knowing that we couldn't necessarily um, uh, sustain, you know, can continue to fund their projects, that was one aspect of it. Although I will say that, you know, anyone that has participated in this program, I'm sure will be permanently part of both the digital grassroots and the NDI families. So whether they want to be or not, um, they will be hearing from us and, you know, being part of that network of, uh, you know, of of grassroots uh, digital rights leaders um, that are part of that. So at least on that side of it, you know, we would love, you know, hope to find ways to engage in the future, but we did want to build in uh, that component of networking. And just to add on to, to that piece, the mentorship program was also a key component that we wanted to include in this because that would allow the individual participants to also meet and interact with a mentor who is advising them on their projects, which again, we hope is more than just a one-off relationship, but somebody that they can go and ask questions to, or at least they've met and can interact with in the future. So we're hoping for that. And ideally, yes, would love to do something in Southeast Asia um, as soon as we find funding for such a program or we do an adaptation there. Um, but this is a model that we, we liked and I think we learned a lot from the first uh, cohort to the second, and there would be more learning in, in the future. Every context is different, but I think uh, for us, we we're really excited about the, the format we had. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that. And as you were speaking, I just remembered that our programs are completely free, so all participants do not have to pay anything to attend. And thanks to the funding for the project, we were able to give a connectivity stipend because that allows for digital rights advocates to engage without having to uh, make the cost because it's very, um, in some spaces we don't, or we take for granted that people can join because there are a lot of issues that stop people from engaging such as access or for example instability and that just makes me uh, think of the success stories. There are quite a few, but I'll just mention two. There's one for which one of our participants is from Haiti, and during the course of the program, there was instability, and there's still instability there. And it was just quite uh, profound to see how his group members were able to engage and support his participation and create solidarity during that time, even though there were challenges with the participation of the participant to join the course that we made it available and flexible for them to still be part of it, to gain support from other participants during a very difficult time in their country. Another success story, that is a success story from the second cohort. Um, the first cohort, there was one participant who did not know about the open internet principles. And after the course, two months later, they messaged us and said, uh, I didn't know about this information, but because of the information I learned from the program, I was able to get a very competitive scholarship to study at a master's level. So it's very transformative for this person's life. And just also to see we have currently at this IGF two digital rights learning exchange participants to see that they're able to come and contribute their voice here. I think that's really a great success story. And we are always happy to collaborate and share uh, what we're learning. And as we're planning to do is to make, um, adapt the program so that it's 
easier to adapt it and uh, it will be accessible online hopefully next year, fingers crossed. Uh, so thank you for those amazing questions. And back to Sarah, yeah. Yeah, I would be remiss if I didn't actually talk about the biggest success story of all of this is that Esther uh, was one of our open internet leaders from a couple of years ago and as part of her project with Digital Grassroots did an iteration of a course on our an adaptation of our uh, advocacy playbook. In that course, we also had a participant from Venezuela um, who successfully completed the course that she did as part of her project. That person, David, uh, went on to apply um, to the Open Internet Leaders Program, the one that is administered by NDI SIP and SEMA, and became an Open Internet Leader. Um, and then he has gone on to do many other things, uh, many fellowships, and has become very successful in the space. Um, and so the fact then that we ultimately were able to, when we had, as NDI, additional funding, because of the success of the course that Digital Grassroots had run, we're able to build off of that and work together as partners in doing this next uh, second round. So all of these have kind of built off of each other. And then we've had other former internet, open internet leaders serve as mentors uh, to this, uh, the Drillix, as I call it, Digital Rights Learning Exchange Program. Um, so we're trying to feed, you know, people back into it, giving back to the program, and those sort of, it, it just kind of builds off of each, uh, each course that we do, participants come back and participate, or they join other, uh, you know, fellowship programs that we're affiliated with. So to me, that's really been a success, is to seeing how that network has interacted and grown and uh, interacted with each other. Thanks for that. I totally forgot some of those success stories. I'm like, yeah, I am the success story. Thank you so much. Over to you, Ufa. I don't know if there are people online. Um, okay, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I just, before we go into our next steps and closing, I just want to ask if there are any other questions online or in person as a whole. Questions, comments, opinions, feedback? Oh, we have one. Yes, please, go ahead. Can we get the microphone, please? Thank you, Morgan Frost, again from SIPE. I just had a follow-up question, maybe for implementers who are looking at developing training content on digital rights, for instance. What were some of the key aspects of the course that you found most useful that we should be aware of? Thanks. Thanks for that question, and we're always happy to share. So our our reports have all the details. But what I found to be really impactful was really the cohesion. From the beginning, our work was adapted to what the community needs. When you're creating a curriculum, you have to do it in community and in consideration of what the participants need. So you ha even the curriculum itself has to be responsive. And uh, as Ufra mentioned, the group work was done and chosen by the participants themselves. So we were very democratic in that process and giving trust, actually, to the conveners. And I really appreciate NDI and Open Internet for Democracy Initiative for really trusting us to do this content and deliver this program successfully to have that level of completion rate in a remote program is really a testament to itself. And these are amazing people who are doing amazing work in their communities. Um, another thing is also to just ensure that um, you're also aware that people are giving their time even when they're coming in the program and not everyone comes from the same place. So providing connectivity stipends, providing mentorship, and also providing flexibility for those who may be facing issues in their countries. Um, 
I also want to emphasize on the human aspects. Digital rights is very personal. It's a, it's a human expression online. And I think what many programs lack is that that personal interaction, treat people with respect and dignity, and recognize that people have faced difficulties in that space, and they're not just taking it like any other program. So those are some of my experiences that I can share. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther. And also to add more to that, um, something that we noticed in developing the curriculum was that it's the essence of the course was to enable these participants to critically think through the digital rights issues that they were working on. So it was very important for us to put in activities that would enable them to do this. Every week for each module for four weeks, or sorry, six weeks, they were able to receive some sort of assignment that would enable them actually really think through these issues and document it. Being able to properly describe something and write it in a few words, half a page or one page, shows that you have actually reflected on what you are writing, you have probably done research about it, and you're able to put this in a coherent way that would make sense to anyone. So apart from just delivering the content, part of, um, apart from just developing content that was made for an online learning environment it was all there was also the learning aspect of enabling the participants to reflect on their own issues and create some sort of content about this this was very important and then after they had done that we had the chance to provide feedback you would realize how they are thinking about the issues and um, give them some sort of steering in that direction and basically tell them how to think about it if they are not thinking about it clearly. So content generation with regards to digital rights shouldn't be only top down, it should be inclusive of the people that are consuming the content as well. Um, yeah, I think that that's what I wanted to add about that. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we have a hand raised. Thank you. Hi, I am, my name is Daniel O'Malley. I'm the Senior Digital Governance Specialist at the Center for International Media Assistance. And one of the questions I have for you in this is, in our work, what we find is in the, we work a lot with journalists and news organizations, and often it is the case that some kind of digital rights violation or issue will, you know, their content will be taken down or their site will face a DDoS attack, and that's what will be the entry point. They hadn't thought about digital rights before, you know, it's, it's until, it, it, impacts them personally. It goes to what you said. Digital rights is often about a very personal experience. Um, and I was just wondering if anyone in your, in your groups uh, come from that kind of uh, a journalistic background, and what, if, if so, what has that been like um, for them, and what have you learned in that um, experience and exchange? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to narrate one experience from one of our participants. During one of our online meetings, they shared that they had been cyber bullied and cyber stalked online. Um, it was a very traumatizing experience for them, and that was their entry point to thinking about the digital rights issues and how they can be a part of it. And um, Another participant wasn't just looking at it from the aspect of an entry point. It was something that they was like a rippling effect to their advocacy. They had created a nice social media page for advocacy, but they realized how that could easily turn into making them some sort of targets for um, trolls online and things like that. So from trying to do online advocacy already, they started um, realizing instances where it can go very dark very fast. And um, a final instance I would like to point out um, is something that Esther had probably already mentioned about a participant who was facing very terrible um, democratic situations in their country and was not able to participate um, by just the virtue of even being able to connect to the internet and join the meetings and things like that. That was very traumatic for them and they had to send a very detailed email to us to say that even a pathway for me to learn how to do digital rights advocacy is blocked by digital rights abuses. So yeah, that was it.
Yeah, and really coming to the personal stories, like one of the participants come from a family of digital rights advocates and they lost their brother in that process. So it's really, when you have that program like that, you know that these are real lives happening and there are real consequences. So uh, what we also found in that same vein was that the intersection of the digital and other topics like digital and someone working on gender, we found uh, that there were some participants who wanted to use the internet and for their own project, maybe on gender equality or LGBTQI rights, and uh, or even just to share their personal story on feminism. And there is a very violent pushback online on those topics. And personal stories are weaponized against um, women, girls, LGBTQI people, and those who are on the margins. So just creating this safe space for everyone to meet and learn that, oh, we have these tools available and we can create this community of solidarity was very important for us. All right, thank you very much. Once again, I'm just going to ask if there are any questions from our on-site, I'm sorry, online participants. Thank you, Hannah, for that uh, and for online moderation. We appreciate you. Um, so in terms of how the groups are created, uh, participants in the first two weeks come on the program and try to understand like what is happening. They take the curriculum. And then after the second week, we ask them, what topics stand out to you the most. And they go in breakout rooms and that's how they form their groups by themselves. We don't um, control or assign anything uh, not based on countries or gender or anything. So this is all uh, participant led. And in terms of future iterations right now, I, I hope we are planning on hopefully putting it online, the curriculum, but that is also a core funding issue that we are trying to solve. We're looking for uh, organizations that are willing to tap into this work and actually um, invest in the people that are working on the ground on digital rights because we all have to start somewhere and we hope that there can be political will from those who have the money. Uh, I'll give Sarah to also answer that. Yeah, way to put me on the spot. No, just kidding. Um, no, I think it goes back to what we were saying uh, before about trying to, you know, sustainability is hard. You know, funding cycles are unpredictable and, you know, we can't always keep everything going. But that's why trying to keep, you know, the, the networking and the, the kind of the groups that were built as sustainable as possible through networking and relationship building and having it be more like a lot of credit goes to digital grassroots for all of the engagement that you had with each participant. It was giving feedback on their assignments and reaching out to them if we hadn't heard from them. And that follow up and constant, you know, communication was really key to keeping participants engaged. It's not easy. It's really hard to do that. And, you know, it's, it's, I, to do that was with the idea of having a cohort that would feel connected long after the, the course ended as much as we could. And but that's also the fact that we can't always do this as much as we want, you know, do plan to adapt the curriculum to be online and the participants, anyone who's interested uh, could do so in an asynchronous manner. It would not of course be the same, but you know, we do believe that this content 
is really important and that there's clearly an appetite for it. We had a lot of applications for, uh, for this program. Again, it's kind of like how for us, for the Open Internet Leaders Program, there's clearly a demand and real interest um, you know, among all of these new emerging and excited uh, digital rights activists out there. And I love to meet demand, unfortunately, you know, yeah, find, find the fund or somewhere. But we're trying, you know, in the ways that we can to keep people together, to connect them, to keep them within our, our networks and reach out to them when there's an opportunity to do so, so as much as possible uh, to do that. Thank you very much. Um, can we take the second question, please? Okay, so I'm going to take that one. <laughs> So in this program, we have actually done a lot to support the participants and give them the confidence that they need to excel as digital rights advocates in their own capacity. We do not necessarily try to define what exactly they should work on because like we have realized digital rights issues can always be quite personal. But whenever we see participants who do not really understand issues or are backed by an issue that they do not even necessarily know is an issue, like how they may be trying to publish a paper or a policy that may be harmful for them in their own communities, that is when we kind of step in to tell them, okay, no, this is not how you necessarily have to talk about that issue because it may not necessarily be safe for you because we know how dictator governments can be quite violent in underrepresented communities and countries. So um, to answer the question in a nutshell, we do not necessarily define how they should talk to their governments, but we encourage, part we support participants that want to do that kind of advocacy to their government. And when we realize that um, some participants' advocacy efforts can simply spiral out of control in a way that wouldn't be safe for them, then we try to let me say, educate them on the challenges and opportunities for doing that kind of dicey advocacy. Does anyone want to add? Yeah, that was a really good question. And I think there are instances where big corporations try to co-opt digital rights movements. So for us as a grassroots organization, our goal is really to teach our participants uh, not what to think or what to do, but how to do it and to make sure that the principles of an open internet and a democratic internet are foundational to how they apply their knowledge or their opinions because contexts differ completely and a very good advantage we have is that we have participants from different countries and we're not focused on a specific issue. So that is a really helpful way for us to just give the tools necessary for the participants also to stay safe in their advocacy not, and also things like avoiding burnout and making sure their issue is very specific and to the point. Thank you all very much. Um, is there any other question on the chat? Comments, inputs, feedback? All right. Thank you once again, everyone, for joining this session. I'm just going to go over the next steps. The first one is to please download the report and share it within your networks. The program report is quite detailed about the mission objectives and the issues that the participants worked on. And that way you can get more insights as, as to how they address these issues and what it means to them. Another thing is to please connect with the digital rights advocates from this program for further collaboration on their internet advocacy community projects. This was, for some of them, this was their first, um, let me say, entrance into working in for a 
project that helps advocacy in their community. So their feedback, your feedback would be really, really useful to them. And um, like it has already been mentioned here, we are currently working and talking about building an asynchronous version of the DRLX course. Stay tuned for that and we will definitely share more. Just before I close the session, finally, I'm just going to invite anyone here who has any final words to please share. Any final words? Nothing special other than just really to highlight the value for us of being able to support these emerging activists and for uh, everyone to look beyond the superstars, so to speak. We often see, you know, particularly at events like these or rights cons or uh, rights con or other um, events like this that you're going to see a lot of those who may already have funding or opportunities or have really made their name already. And I think it's really important for us to try to find those ne that next generation of leaders or those who just haven't had that opportunity because, you know, we are seeing, given the, the crisis online of trying to put, you know, promote an open and democratic internet is going to take everybody, not just elites, not just urbanites, but, you know, those new to the space, those across multiple sectors, um, geographies, you know, we're all in this together and um, really trying to help support those, those new leaders, those who really are excited and passionate but just may not have had the opportunity. So, um, yeah, I, again, I hope, Ufa, you've given where to find all of those resources. Okay. Um, I also, I'll make one more plug for openinternet.global. You can also follow us on Twitter at OpenNetGlobal. <laughs> and, yeah, any other plugs you want to give? Yeah, thank you so much. And yes, uh, our recent blog is on this, the Digital Rights Learning Exchange, and you can go to www.digitalgrassroots.org. And I just want to say to those listening or to those who are trying to plan this project that investing in people is the only way we're going to get a democratic internet. And it has to be done intentionally if it's going to be sustainable. But I also just want to thank those who joined online and our online moderator for holding the fort online and those who couldn't make it to the IGF. And uh, also just to close, Digital Grassroots, our work really is not only for those who are in the tech space. We recognize that our world is becoming digital. And I like to say that the internet is a public utility. So the courses that we do really are for everyone for us to build a future that is open and democratic. Thank you all for joining us here today as well. I'll just allow Ufer to close. All right, thank you everyone. And just to clarify where the program report is, we've put a link to it on the session, on this session description. So if, you're, if you already have access to the session, there's definitely a link for it there. Thank you very much once again, everyone, for joining. And yes, please reach out to us for anything. Thank you very much.